Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Nexus Gaming Series Division C West Paraloot versus Datasto. Game one here will be played on Battlefield of Eternity, Paraloot's choice of battleground. And while we've got a few minutes waiting for that task, though, to trickle in here, let's go ahead and take a look at the Sea West standings as we're just crossing over the halfway point here in the Nexus Gaming Series Season 6. You can see Paraloot sitting at 6th place. That task, though, sitting at 8th place. Uh, that task, though, in particular... Um, kind of clinging to that last playoff spot. Uh, eight of the nine, of course, and C West will make it into the playoffs. Uh, luckily for DTT, they do have a couple of uh, games in hand to make up some points. But you can see, really, um, you know, five, six, seven, and uh, and eight, even actually all the way down to nine. All those teams are are pretty close. So uh, trying to clamor for all the points uh, that you can get. Just waiting apparently for DTT to finish up a brawl and then they will be joining us. So let's talk about Battlefield of Eternity. Actually, let's talk about um, our current bans in the State of Nexus gaming series. If you did not know, Garrosh currently has a bug to where he can throw a friendly vehicle, either the Triglav Protector or the Dragon Knight, um, with into the fray. So that talent has been banned on Volskaya Foundry and also has been banned on Dragonshire. Lucio and Chromie, due to their massive reworks, uh, will be banned until next week. I won't see any of those two new heroes. I'm very curious to see where they're going to come into the meta ne next week. Uh, Lucio, in particular... I have heard a lot of people raving about him. All right, looks like we do have DTT here. We'll be starting momentarily, so let's talk about Battlefield of Eternity. It's the only two-lane battleground currently in the NGS competitive pool. Uh, wave clear, not quite as prioritized on the as on some of the larger three-lane maps. Um, but racing, racing on that Immortal is very, very important. You have to have that single target burn to race that objective. And it really puts an emphasis on um, a slightly different meta on this battleground than you see on other ones. Um, Vala is a little bit out of the meta right now, uh, but you can see her on BOE. Greymane kind of hovering around the fringes of the meta, more valuable on BOE. Uh, Artanis is high priority here, as is Li Ming. Um, so those heroes just um, become more valuable due to their single target burn. And for Li Ming in particular, it's because she can do it from so far away so, so safely. So here we are. First pick, first ban. Going over to that task, though, and they're going to take out Johanna. That is an interesting ban. Usually at this point in the season, the book on these teams is out. The Stats of the Storm is there. The Heroes Profile information is there. The VODs are there. The Casts are there. These teams all know each other as this draft is flying along. So in addition to the meta bans and the map bans, you're going to see targeted bans, and that, to me, is what that Johanna is. Um, maybe a comfort pick for Paraloot. A Paraloot banning out the first pick of Nubarak, who is one of the top two meta tanks in NGS right now, with Diablo, who actually gets through. So, Rayman and Tassadar banned out, and then a first pick variant. So, uh, one of the funner things uh, when you. Funner? Funner is not a word. One of the more fun things about casting all over the various divisions as Paraloot grabs Diablo and Hanzo, who used to be top, top tier here on BOE. Uh, but since that build was nerfed, um, not quite as powerful, but still good. Anna and Artanis due to the amateur opponent taken by Datas, though. Um, casting all over the various divisions, uh, seeing the different 
hero prioritizations and uh, the different metas within you know within the divisions um and there's a different different definite difference you know casting up at a or heroic and, and coming down to b or, or c or even down to d it's if you ever watch um the nexus edge the content those guys are producing they kind of talk about the individual division metas and it's a pretty fascinating study um as the coordination the the level of coordination and and you know in the play changes what heroes get prioritized so we do have rainer that's going to round out the damage here for Paraloot. they did go ahead and ban phoenix imperious ban coming out from that task though i really like that imperious ban he's a little bit of a soft counter to diablo and Paraloot taking sonia who we don't see as much um leaving their support to last and then we have an alarak and a genji so that task though going really spicy i know genji is a ranged assassin but but he's really not in the traditional sense he needs to get in there to do his work so i have to guess this is a twin blades variant it is gonna be my guess all melee with the exception of anna of course for that task though um, and then an Ariel coming out for Peru. Interesting. So Diablo is going to have his hands full um, if you're Paraloot. Um, and that's really the only hard CC they have other than the occasional whip coming out by the Ariel. So it's going to be very difficult, I think, for Paraloot to keep the Alarak and the Genji um, off of Ariel and Raynor in particular. But with an all melee comp, if you kind of fall behind in in levels, it gets much harder to find your footing because you can't stay at a safe distance or, or use defensive structures to your advantage nearly as well when you need to step into melee range to do your damage. So Paraloot here, I think, will have the advantage if they can get up and level uh, you know level two or three levels it's it's really going to make their lives much much easier um and on the flip side i really want to see what variant is going to go maybe he's going to go smash i don't know this is a really non-traditional comp coming out by dat task though so we'll see which way they decide to go. On the left side, in the blue trunks, we have Paraloot, Argo Booster, playing Anzo, Swill on Diablo, Helio on Ariel, Toasty on Jimmy Rayner, and in the top lane, Arthen playing Sonya. The red team, Dat Tasto, Team Captain Kurt Dog will be on Alarak. Trevaro is playing Genji. Austin Powers on Ana Shadow Leaves on Varian and in the top lane playing opposite Sonya we have Crypt Digger on Artan. Writing the Zerg League though seems a little sacrilegious the uh, Protoss writing the Zerg League there. Diablo um taking a lot of early poke. I always the running joke with my team is anytime I play Diablo I always have like a death within the first minute because I'm so used to Diablo being so tanky, and uh, as Diablo or uh, Genji gets put into the wall, and he's gonna go down. That was like a max distance, just barely catching the a shadow charge and taking out the Genjo. But what I started to say, I'm so used to Diablo being tanky and indestructible that I always kind of forget in the first minute of the game he doesn't have any souls, and I always have a stupid death. Uh, but Swill, not making that mistake, catching out the Genjo and anchoring the bush. That task, though, really pushing in the bottom lane, controlling it. Uh, wave clear for the side of that task, though, is not particularly good. Here is Genji arriving. He goes right into the thick of it again, forcing Paraloot to step back just a little bit. Uh, but the wave clear from that task, though, is, is not particularly good. So I would expect Paraloot to control this laning phase a little bit. I don't want to ignore our Valiant solo laner so in just a moment i'm going to try to find a little bit of a lull to go check out the action in the top lane see how artanis and sonia are faring and it looks like uh, they're kind of going about even 
Sonya and Arcanus really brawling out with each other. The swapped himself into tower range. That's not something you really want to do there if you're Crypt Digger. Meanwhile, bottom lane, Ana having a hard time keeping up with the Rainer and Hanzo poke damage, and it's going to be consistent um, if you are Aerolu. The constant poke from Hanzo and Rainer, constant auto attacks onto really a number of heroes as there is the char whip and then the shadow charge. Genji limping away. Diablo might have overstayed. Heal coming out from Helio, keeping Swill up. Uh, camp, it's about camp time for both of these teams, but neither team really seems all that interested in going over to grabbing those bruiser camps. Varian will think about going back to the Hall of Storms to top off, but, but then thinks better of it. We do have level 4, so let's see what Varian goes, and it is going to be a taunt Varian. I was thinking with this non-traditional comp is Toasty gets taunted, but luckily... The damage from Kurt Dog just missed with the silence, otherwise Toasty might have been in trouble there. Um, with the non-traditional comp that Datasto is utilizing this game, I really thought they might have done something um, kind of spicy. There is the flip and the charge misses the wall. Genji going deep though, combined with the taunt, is able to take out the Rainer. So evening the kills at one kill apiece. Meanwhile, on the red immortal, Hanzo went up there and started doing the work. So we've got a little bit of a head start for Paraloot in the bottom lane. Pretty much all of the members of Tat Dat Tasta, with the exception of Artanis, are wailing on this and have currently taken the lead um, in this initial halftime race. And Dat Tasto will secure this halftime. Of course, first objective always goes to the offensive side. So it looks like, as is tradition, very rarely do you see on this first objective either team... Um, Kind of going hard at this point. Usually they'll trade out. But we do have a DC on Diablo. So we'll take a pause here. And usually regardless of the outcome of halftime. Teams aren't going to fight under the offensive side immortal to defend theirs. They're kind of going to trade out. Burn as much shielding as they can. The first immortal doesn't get a ton of value. So it's not a huge deal either way. Currently though, um, Paralute, is, despite uh, losing halftime, is actually up on a moral damage a little bit. And I imagine with a Rainer and a Hanzo and a Sonya, their their damage, their burn, is gonna, simply going to be better. Even, even with a, uh, an amateur opponent on the other side. So it looks like we are ready to go. We have resumed. And 506. Paralute does win the first objective by only 506. So this immortal will simply not have very much shielding. It will spawn in the top lane and begin to push there. Sonya resuming her soaking duties in the bottom. But it looks like all five members of that test, though, are here. That is going to be a soak advantage for Paralus. Sonya is going to be unopposed. Um, I would really like them to send somebody to the bottom lane if you're that task, though, to counter that soak. Um, there is the uh, stun and the stun and the overcharge. Crypt Digger really low, forced himself to walk back through that gate. Um, this is one of the disadvantages of such a melee heavy comp is in order to defend or do anything, they just have to put themselves in harm's way. If Paralute can take these fights kiting backwards, I, I really like their chances better. But look at all the, the miss soak, the level difference just off that short time. Uh, Sonya doing some structure damage here as well, uh, and also getting her team about a half level lead. Uh, Sonic Arrow will reveal where that Tasto is. They were thinking about that top siege camp. Um, decided against it, now putting some damage on the Varian. The swap does not go out. There's a little Shadow Charge. Taunt doesn't go, though. Stepping back with the Diablo threatening on the flank. The health bars of Paralute are so much uh, higher. Uh, Telekinesis misses. The swap from Arcanus misses. I will say, though, uh, the Alarak has been struggling to land his Silence combo. Uh, but look at here. An Anna, Alarak, Genji invasion. They are a little late to get the camp, but they might not be too late to get Sonya. The Telekinesis misses again. Oh my goodness, heartbreaking. If you're that task, though, Kurt Dog has been struggling to hit those Telekinesis uh, a little bit, struggling to hit his silences. 
Um, if he starts to hit those, though, there have been a lot of opportunities for Dat Tasto. And if he starts to hit those combos, Paraloot could be in trouble. So top camp secured by the side of Paraloot. And as we saw moments ago, bottom camp secured as well. They're already moving into objective positions. Oops, that's not the way I wanted to go. That Tasto is on their camp. They're going to be a hair late, and they have two other lanes push to deal with. Um, now all members are coming in to defend. Only four here for uh, Paraloot. Swap does go out on Ariel. She could be in trouble. There's the Tond under the Immortal. She does get pushed and booped around, and down she goes. Ariel going down. Kurt Dog, though, on the Alarak is very low. This melee heavy comp really pushing in, but a flanking Sonya lands the spear, holds Artanis down, able to finish the kill. Sonya going to get pushed into the Immortal Stun and then silenced and then taunted, forced to retreat, spinning to keep herself up. Varian is in trouble, escapes with less than 200 hit points, very low health bars from both sides. Sonya as well, less than 300. But halftime will go over to Paraloot. They're about a half level up. That Tasto did clear out the uh, mercenaries. And now with it on the friendly side, both teams moving into position to defend. Genji going in deep, does finish the kill on Hanzo. Eats the stun from the Immortal, though. Rainer is in the top lane. Sonya on her way here. Paralu really needs to back up. Yavo in trouble. There's the swap. He's body blocked in. Down he goes. Uh, no full soul, so that will be a full respawn timer there. Timer for Diablo. Sonya and Ariel retreating. Rainer, though, meanwhile, in the top lane, is pushing and soaking, and he will get level 10s for his team here first. Those kills will likely secure this objective for that Tasto. Sonya does get telekinesis in taunted. Crystal Aegis to keep him alive on top of a dragon arrow. Apoc, big combo, using those level 10s right away for Paraloot. Alarak goes down, as does Varian. That Tasto does secure the Immortal. Artanis actually was run down by Raynor and Hanzo. So objective goes over to Dat Tasto, uh, but they paid for it with three deaths. Uh, let's go over this heroics. We do have uh, Wrath of the Berserker, I believe, yes. Dragon's Arrow, Raynor's Raynor's, or Jimmy Jr., Crystal Aegis, uh, and Apocalypse for Paraloot. And for the side of that pass, though, it is uh, Counter-Strike. Yes, Counter-Strike for Alarak. Genji not showing yet, so Genji TBD. Mana boost for Ana. Suppression Pulse for Artanis. And it's going to be Shield Wall uh, for Varian. So pretty even game, five to four in kills. About a level advantage uh, for the side of Paraloot. And a slight structure lead as well. But neither side has secured a full fort yet. Genji making his way on the flank, checking his bush, checking the bushes with his uh, ninja stars there. Scatter arrow going to keep an eye on him as well. Jumps over the wall. There's the combo that Kurt Dog is missing. However, he maybe steps too far forward. Counter Strike is proc. Not quite able to finish him off. Dragon arrow holds him in place just long enough for Toasty on Rainer to pin it, finish him off. So they thought they caught. Uh, Got Rainer there, but it's actually the counter engagement which takes out the Alarak. And now gonna push in with these minions, maybe take out a well, do a little bit of fort damage here. And the side of Paraloot has very good siege damage with Hanzo and Rainer. They will shred through these structures pretty quick. Uh, minions about dead. Now backing up. I imagine they're gonna start targeting camps some now. Uh, about now, as the objective will be here shortly. There it is. They're going to move on to bottom. Jimmy Jr. was anchoring that bush for them. Genji does get shadow charged and overpowered. Rainer on the flank putting some damage, able to juke the Alarak combo. Meanwhile, bottom lane, they do secure the camp. Genji goes in on it a little bit late, walks away for his troubles. Seven seconds to the Immortal. Paraloot. Going right on to their bruiser camp. So Paradox actually shown a little bit a little bit stronger merc management here this game. Um, and I think that's allowed them to get on these objectives. They leave it and leave it to Genji. Oh my goodness, that was a miscommunication. Genji pays for it with his life. But uh, all the members of Paraloot, they finished the merc camp. Dragon Arrow parts the Red Seas there, hits nobody. And then nobody actually stood on it. They all left. Genji swift-striked over the wall, took it, and then died. So
Sonia eats the arrow. There goes Diablo in. Shadow Charge flip. Apoc goes down. Catches two, including Artana Smith's swap. Uh, but Paraloot is under the Immortal. That is not a great place to fight, as you can tell. A number of their members have been hit by the stun. Sonia going deep, trying so hard to finish that Artanis, and she does. Still fighting under the Immortal, forcing to dodge the stuns. There's Diablo, catches Artanis. Kurt Dog getting low again, as are many members of Paraloot. But Sonia deep spinning onto the back line has been such a terror this game. Not quite able to finish off the kills, and I spoke too soon. Genji picking up the counter kill onto the Sonya, and real nice play by Trevaro there. Uh, despite that, that's three unanswered, or three to one, I should say, in kills in favor of Perlute, this objective phase, and they will now secure the Immortal. Diablo is kind of sharking around, zoning on his own Immortal, seeing if they were gonna start a camp, and, and they do. So that task, though, they will show on this camp if Paraloot sniffs it out and they haven't. They're going to finish this camp. It will push um, in the top lane, I believe. Yes, uh, we'll push down the top lane. Uh, same lane as the Immortal. Uh, this fort is going to go down, though. Sonya will resume her off lane soaking, trying to expand that lead that Paraloot has here. An excellent whip there, followed up by the Shadow Charge. Unable to get the uh, Overpower to hold Varian in there. That will hold him there, though. A big two-person Dragon Arrow. The Apoc was a little bit late. He would have hit that a second earlier. It would have just crushed that task, though. Uh, however, they are pushing in, sieging effectively. Raynor is able to juke on the swap uh, from Artanis. Damage now starting to go on the keep. Sonya and... Genji squaring off in the bottom lane. Kurt Dog on Alarak taking a lot of damage. The spin from the Immortal forcing Dentasto back. Anzo vault vaulting over the wall, and the first keep of the game falls. This Immortal sitting at about 25% health. So if they can get a kill, Paraloot that is, they might be able to create something out of this. Alarak hit by the Immortal stun. However, it will go down. Varian does get swap uh, swapped a short distance. Even with the Crystal Agents, I don't see him getting out of this, and he does not. Ariel doing her support thing, trying so hard to keep Raynor up, probably sacrificed herself as well. And yes, Anzo needs to be careful too. Uh, jumping over the wall, using the Scatter Arrow for the dismount. So Paraloot does secure the keep, first keep of the game. Uh, but then they kind of hung around and overstayed. And uh, that task, though, able to pick up two counter kills on the back. Now they are trying to catch up to this same talent tier. Artanis is soaking the bottom lane, securing this top siege camp. However, um, Paraloot is sharking around, and they see Artanis in the bottom lane. Apoc, Arrow, Apocalypse catches two. And taking a 3v4 is Paraloot and winning it. Alarak gets absolutely wrecked. The Shadow Charge into the wall. Once Diablo gets his damage uh, at 13 on the Shadow Charge, you really have to be careful. Sonya trying to get Austin Power. She is split away. Um, if they want her, they will kill her. Uh, Ariel is actually coming on the backside. There is no scenario. I see that Austin Powers gets out of this. Or is there? Oh, they see her. Is Jimmy Jr. going to get her? Oh, so close. The great escape almost accomplished there by Austin Powers. And now taking away a, a defensive structure there just to make sure members of that task, though, can't escape. An interesting uh, play there. Paraloot going immediately on to this bottom immortal. And it is halftime already. They burn that thing really really fast top lane too. take a look at that mini map ladies and gentlemen katas are starting to build up there's two they are pretty close to the core so paraloot can slow play this if they choose to 
Um, they are backing up. There's the taunt onto Ariel, then the swap, forced to self-crystal Aegis. Sonya is all in the thick of that, though. A full barroom brawl breaking out, and it looks like it is that task, though, who is on the losing end one more time. Sonya is just in the middle of everything. There goes the APOC. That will probably keep Sonya up and the whip on the variant. In the meantime, though, the other members of Paraloot secured a full shield immortal it will start to barrel down the bottom lane this should be a second keep or are they looking at core here a little bit of indecision coming out by paralute here i'd like to see them either be with the immortal or not and this is why diablo gets alarak and taunted and down he goes that's exactly why it seemed like there was some indecision there great defense by that task though taking out the entire front line of diablo and sonia if paralute would have simply gone with the immortal they would have really put that task though on the back foot but now this is going to be three unanswered kills as ariel is certain uh, to go down there there's the slow taking the damage from everybody and down she goes Still not defending this keep, though. A Varian is over here doing his best to finish the keep, and that will probably be enough, as this Immortal is very healthy. It was a little bit raggedy from Paraloot. A lot of indecision. Um, but they do get the keep simply because this Immortal was so very strong. And look at what this Immortal is doing now with no help. Essentially, it took down a keep and 30% of the core. Imagine if all the members of Paraloot would have simply marched down that lane with the Immortal that, that could have been game one. So fortunate for that task, though, that they were able to make something happen there, uh, close the level lead a little bit, and keep this game alive. I would have liked them see a little be a little bit more aggressive, though, on the back of... The kills that they secured there only getting the one um i don't think they're gonna get here in time oh maybe do they catch sonia they do they have arrived in time and full members there's the swift strike the swap does catch her it puts her back on the point she retreats anyway but goes down great pick um by that task though in the meantime in the bottom lane a couple members of Paraloot are escorting in a Merc Camp and a Kata. And are they trying to backdoor? You can't do it with two people, 5v4. Swap just misses onto Hanzo. Swill wisely using that Hellgate to get himself out of there. Um, and I think they got to go clean up the mess that is top lane. It was a cute idea, but that Tasta really responded very quickly to that backdoor threat. So uh, I would really like to see Paraloot exercise a lot of patience. They have two lanes with Catapults, and they still have to wait for Sonya. You can't get caught here. You absolutely can't get caught here. Raynor is going to go down. Yeah, and that was so well played by that task, though. Not just the Bush Party. The Bush Party was fantastic. But it was the patience to actually let Diablo go by. They simply let him walk by and waited for the juicier target in Jimmy Rayner. Halftime, going over to that Tasto. And now with 43 seconds, I want to see Paraloot simply give this up. They have all of their structures and literally no reason to fight for this. None whatsoever. It's just inviting trouble. And you can see Kurt Dog down here. He wants to take to this Counter-Strike, and that is exactly why... Ariel, absolutely wrecked. And the deaths continue to stagger for Paraloot. You could see Kurt Dog channeling way down here, just waiting for his moment. As soon as Ariel stepped forward, right back to the Hall of Storm. Shadow Leaves was there as for the assist, uh, as well as a stun from the Immortal. So a nearly full strength, minute 20 Immortal. However, this needs to be dealt with. This is three catapults on the core. Genji going to be forced to be on cleanup duty. He's going to have to clear up bottom as well. Let's see how far Dat Tasto can take this. He does catch the Hanzo 
and down he goes. This is exactly what I was talking about in the early game. Kurt Dog was was struggling a little bit to hit his skill shots in the early game, but man, mid game he has been absolutely money. And the last couple minutes in particular, been responsible for setting up the staggered deaths that has vaulted that Tasto back in this game. And here he is sitting there chomping at his, chomping at the bit again, charging up, waiting to charge in there and wreck somebody's day. Let's see who oversteps. Great patience by Kurt Dog, waiting for the Immortal to get in here so he doesn't have to tank the court. There's the swap, misses. They were targeting Rainer there. And now that Tasto is stepping in. There's the taunt. Down goes Rainer. Crystal Aegis was used as well. Diablo going down. This could be game as four members go down. And when Paraloot looks back at this game, it is going to be a game of missed opportunity. What a comeback for that Tasto taking game one in a resounding, dramatic comeback fashion really well played down the stretch those guys were down to no structures no forts no keeps paraloot had all of their forts and keeps up they staggered deaths they made a very strong defense and, and paraloot unfortunately allowed themselves to be staggered time after time after time again that Tasta wins that late game objective. And they ride it all the way to the end. I really want to highlight Kurt Dog. I was picking on him in the early game a bit. He, he was struggling. But oh boy, down the stretch did he come up big. Really made some big time plays. Uh, setting up the kills. Um, in particular, that Ana from, from way downtown. Shadow, or not shadow charging, counter striking. From, uh, from probably out of vision. I, I don't imagine that Paraloot knew Alarak was, was in that particular spot just, just waiting uh, to come in and make the kill. So really nice job of sticking with it there by that test. So we're going to put that BRB screen up and we will be back in about 60 seconds. Hang tight.
All right, we are back for game two, which will be played at Alterec Pass. Paralute stinging from that uh, game one loss. Decided to go with um, first pick. And they have chosen. Uh, they've chosen first pick, and that Dat Tasto has decided to go with map pick here to Alterac Pass. So that game won, woo! That was, uh, that was quite a comeback because that Tasto looked to be dead to rights. Um, but there were a lot of, um, Lessons that game. Tough lessons if you're Paralute. Um, poor Rainer. But when the enemy is off the map, you have to assume that they're looking for you, and they were. He just strayed too close to that bush. He didn't even go into it. He just was kind of next to it. Um, and they took him out. Particularly in, in that kind of situation where Dat Tasto is significantly behind at that point in the game. And they have to make a play. You have to be aware of the hyper aggression and, and not giving the other team that opportunity to to create a chance to take the game back. And unfortunately, Perlo did it a couple times. There's a stagger death. Um, the Ariel pick under the Immortal was so huge. Uh, once Rainer was down, those guys just had to back up and concede. You had all of your structures up, but more deaths would have made it worse. But here we go. Game two, Paralute trying to recover. Once again, banning the namesake of that Tasto with Tassadar being banned out by Paralute, Anubarak being banned out by DTT, and uh, last ban here for Paralute in the early goings. Let's see who they go with. It is gonna gonna be Genji. Genji was a problem uh, and played uh, very well in that game one by DTT. Will not see him here game two. Genji is one of those heroes that uh, you don't see a lot of, but when he's played well, he is really strong. Actually, Alarak is that way, too. He, he's kind of a little bit of an all-or-nothing hero. A first pick, Hanzo. So, Perilous sticking with the Hanzo. Uh, and then on the flip side, there's the early pick, Johanna. So, that explains... No, actually, that was uh, DTT who banned Johanna. So, high prioritization on Johanna these two games. First, first game was a ban. Second game was an early pick here by DTT. Also selecting the Rainer. Back on the Ariel there for Paralu. Also picking up the Junkrat. Junkrat is a, uh, a choice. I like that. Uh, for Altrak Pass in particular, he's really good at stalling out the channel on the uh, the Jailbreak there. The uh, Endless Nades and all the other annoying things that Junkrat does I think makes him particularly viable on Altrak Pass. Ditch is banned out by that task though. And then Ana, I really like that band coming out for uh, Paralute. I think Ana is one of the strongest heroes in the meta right now. She's really, really good. Uh, we do have Karazim, Jaina. Jaina and Rainer go together really well as well. Um, assuming you're taking Ace in the hole at one if you're Rainer. Really pairs so, so strong with all the permaproc slows that Jaina has. It's like a, a permanent 15% you know, AA bonus damage for Jimmy Rayner really amps up his damage. Um, of course, Johanna has slows to offer as well. So, uh, nice pick there coming out with the Jimmy Rayner. Uh, back on the Diablo. This time, though, taking the Varian for themselves. He will be in the off-tank flanking position 
And boy, that Tasto does like the spicy as an insta-pick uh, butcher. Uh, no hesitation whatsoever. Wow. I cannot tell you the last time I casted a butcher game. And it has been a hot minute. I've, uh, I've been casting since Chair League Season 2. Um, pretty consistently, and it has been a long time since I have casted. I can't e honestly. I can't even remember the last time I casted a butcher in a competitive game. I'm excited. I'm excited to see what he can do. And when you have a butcher, though, you really have to recognize the early game limitations. Really pick your spots because um, you have to stack up stack up those meats. It's kind of similar to. Kel'Thuzad that way. The, the early to mid game is all about stacking up your baseline quest as much as you can. And then once you hit your meat stacks, in the case of Butcher, you get the giant golden meat cleaver. It, it He really just steps up to another power level. So game number two, Paralute trying to pick up a point, force that game three. Swill back on Diablo. Argle booster. Uh, will be on Ariel, Toasty on Junkrat, Helio on Hanzo, and Kerthin on Varian. For the side of Datas, though, Trevaro will be on Karazim. Shadow Leaves playing Johanna, I believe. They're kind of pumped up. Crypt Digger will be on Jaina. Kurt Dog going from Alarak to Butcher, and that's the sweet new Butcher skin. And all by himself in the top lane, Austin Powers playing Jimmy Rayner. So Butcher already splitting off as Paraloot was playing very passive in the mid lane, not wanting to give him anything free. Members of that Tasto already off in lane soaking. Paraloot now will rotate to their lanes. It's going to be Hanzo in the bot and Varian in the top. I don't think I've ever seen a Hanzo Butcher solo lane matchup. I imagine Hanzo will do just fine as long as he keeps himself out of trouble. Speaking of trouble, Diablo does arrive. Shadow Leaves is there to reinforce. There's the blind on the Hanzo and the ch stun and the charge. And Argo Booster goes down. So maybe baited a little bit there with the rotation from Shadow Leaves, able to hold Hanzo down just long enough to finish him off. Now they're rotating back toward mid. In the meantime, top lane, Jimmy will win this over time, especially before four. After four, depending on what Varian does. Oh, I missed it. I'm a terrible caster. Butcher does go down in the mid lane to minions, it looks like. So I would imagine he shadow charged a little bit too deep there. I'd like to see these teams start to move toward the mid lane bruiser camp. This The mid lane camp on uh, Alterac is more powerful than the bosses, which are pretty weak. Um, and, and most teams will prioritize them right about now. So uh, members of that task, though, are doing that. Uh, Butcher staying passively in mid to collect as much meat as possible. Now it looks like Paraloot will go ahead and move on to their camp. Um, and I imagine both of these will be secured at pretty close to the same time. Cancel each other out mid. There's the Butcher going in hard on that Wizard minion. And that Wizard minion is absolutely hosed. Uh, that was an interesting use of that charge there just to kind of get out of that mud if you're Butcher there. The Butcher sitting at 25 of, I believe, 300, 200. Yeah, 300 would be a lot. So probably not stacking quite as fast as he would like, but they've only secured the one kill thus far. Going on to the Ariel, there's the blind, there is the condemn, there is the punish, but they are under towers and Karazim goes down with no minions to tank that. Uh, Paraloot was really in trouble and it is Taunt Varian. I didn't have a chance to go over that yet, but Varian does go with Taunt once more. Karazim going down, diving a little too deep. DTT is for the kill. Doing their best to try to get Kurt Dog some stacks, but if he doesn't start stacking up here pretty soon, 
Um, they're not going to get much value out of this Butcher pick. Karazim has spawned. He is on his way. He's charged, interrupted by Diablo, and then he is taunted and absolutely obliterated, as is Shadow Leaves. Austin Powers in trouble as well. So Paraloot showing no ill effects of that game one loss, coming out with a vengeance. Four early kills, first to channel the objective. And now Rainer is all the way in the top, so if that Tasta wants to try to contest this, it's going to be a 5v4 at least initially. There's the charge. If it was a feint, Junkrat putting down that mine uh, in case. Blizzard going out to zone, but now it will be off cooldown. Uh, Rainer's still not here, but that Tasto doesn't seem to mind. They're really stepping in. Now Rainer has arrived. It might be a little bit too late, or is it? That Tasto going in hard. There's the charge. Does hit the Varian, who is... Really getting wailed on, but great peels by Swill there, keeping Varian alive. A three-man condemn. Both sides very low, but neither one able to really secure any kills. That Tasto really bullied their way into that objective, uh, canceling it with, with but six seconds to go if you're Paraloop. Both sides regrouping. Varian and Butcher both had to go all the way back to the Hollow Storms, and they are just now arriving for round number two. Uh, Swill really had a fantastic play in the middle of that fight to peel Kurt Dog off of Barry and kept his teammate alive. But... Charge going on to Varian again. This time he cancels it. There is a concussion mine waiting for him again. Toasty really using those mines as kind of a anti-butcher tools, just trying to disrupt Butcher as much as he can. A team's now moving away. Butcher has taken up a position in the bottom lane. Oh my goodness. Rainer didn't take Ace in the hole. Caladorn, I didn't even notice. Thank you for pointing it out. I just assumed he would. Shadow Lead gets a four-man condemn right on top of a blizzard. And then a flanking Butcher. They are able to kill the Diablo. Oh my goodness. Shadow Leaves, though going really aggressive and uh i don't think uh iron skin was quite off cooldown a counter kill coming out for paraloot yeah if, you, if you're uh i i really try not to pick on builds too too much but if you're a rainer and you are with a jaina ace in the hole pretty much always they are able to get a counter kill on to Hanzo though 68 stacks, waiting for the charge to come up. That's going to be another 20 stacks there with the uh, Ariel death. Neither side able to channel the objective quite yet. Arazine very low. Force to go back to the Hall of Storms. Jaina is in trouble, though. Butcher is there. Pseudo peels for, and now Kurt Dog and Shadow Leaves are in trouble. Concussion Mine catches two. Taunt goes on to the Butcher, but Varian decided to rethink his life's choices. Backed up. Paraloot now once again trying to channel the, uh, again, Concussion Shot. Uh, piercing round, right? Piercing round? Yeah, from Varian. Forces the interrupt and another three-person condemned. Shadow Leaves is really being aggressive. Counter taunt there. Jaina and Butcher not here. Will be arriving shortly. Tap topped off from their visit to the Hall of Storms. Now, this is about as long of a first objective as I have seen on Alterac Pass. These teams really brawling it out and Neither side able to quite get an advantage. The biggest advantage Paralude has is they're closer to 10. That, that's really the main difference. Another three-man condemn. There goes Jimmy. Butcher is on the flank. Kind of extended. Goes right into the bear trap. Waiting for his moment. Kurt Dog is really great patience there. Getting a little damage into the Diablo. Uh, that Tasta once again forcing back Paralude. The uh, consistent damage from... Uh, Jaina and Rainer forcing those guys back. And that's that's kind of something you have to think about when you have an Ariel as a healer. Um, when you're retreating and not doing damage to fill up her hope bar, Ariel is not able to heal on the retreat. In the team fight, she's great, but on the retreat, it, it's hard for her to do that. Level 10s are here for Paraloot, and there it is. Dragon Arrow into Apoc again, but Apoc just a hair late. There is the Riptire. 
A uh, Curb Dog taunted on the backside. However, Karazim goes in. Curb Dog is not going to stay alive. So first kill going down there. Ariel forced to self Aegis, but Karazim goes in hard, able to finish off the Ariel and get away. Varian falls. So uh, Datasta really turning this around. Health bars are so low, and it is a falling sword. Johanna trying to get on the Diablo, not able to finish it. Karazim goes down. So a very back and forth all over the place fight as Junkrat um, taking cleanup duty there. Three kills on mop-up duty. Toasty just finishing off those heroes who were so, so low health. So I didn't really have a chance to go over the heroics, but it is uh, Dragon Arrow, uh, actually a Warbringer, uh, not Shield Wall for Barry and a 10, Rip Tire, Crystal Aegis, and Apocalypse. And for the side of Detas, though, it is uh, Furnace Blast, Water Elemental, Divine Palm, Falling Sword, which isn't one you see too much, and uh, and Hyperion. And actually, if uh, as the uh, Butcher goes on to Diablo, really chunks him out hard, but the uh, Rip Tire is there for the counter engage and really does a number on Kurt Dog. There's the Apoc, forced. Oh my goodness. Oh, wow. I've never seen that before. The Concussion Mine actually killed Butcher in midair. And you saw his body split in half as the ragdoll uh, physics came in there. If Raynor took Ace in the hole at one and Johanna went Falling Sword, which she did, that is another slow. Um, unless they changed that, but I'm pretty sure it's a big time slow. Yeah, so that is another slow to proc Ace in the hole if you're if you're Jimmy Raynor there. With, with the comp that that Tasto is, 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 is utilizing here. Ace in the hole would have been so good. So just like game one, it's Paraloot taking the early game. Um, about a full level lead. 11 to 6 in kills. Butcher is having a hard time stacking almost 11 minutes into the game. And he's not even halfway through. So Hanzo is out here providing vision for his team while they secure this bottom lane boss. The bosses on Alterac just are not very powerful. That task, though, if they push with this mid-wave mercenary, they will get more value than Parallel Will with the boss. Now, here comes uh, the members of that task, though. The Furnace Blast used too early. Kurt Dog gets himself into trouble, and down he goes. Here goes the arrow, hits two, and the Rip Tire, and the Apocalypse. Great play by Paraloot. Uh, only able to secure one. I thought they might have gotten rain or two, but really nice setup. Dragon Arrow into Apocalypse, uh, into the Rip Tire, and they're going to push down with, uh, with the boss that I'm going to call Weak Sauce. Hyperion used in defense here, uh, kind of forcing the members of Paraloot back, but they're doing the best they can to put the structure damage there. Argo Booster is just eating this full Hyperion. <laughs> Like, all the damage is going right into Argo Booster. He does not seem to care, though, doing as much structure damage as they can. Butcher was concussion mined into the danger zone, uh, able to get back. Falling Sword on the back line catches two right into a blizzard. Now Butcher wants to go in, and he wants to clean up, but the concussion mine again. Toasty mine using those... Or Toasty using those concussion mines as a Butcher counter engage is a really clever use of that. However, that was three heroes worth of stacks... I just said like a minute ago that he wasn't even halfway done. Now we're at 12 minutes in and he's 160 stacks. If Butcher fully stacks, the game completely changes. Uh, does a complete 160. That task though is channeling the objective. They will get it and they will have about 10 seconds or so before all the members of Paraloot are up and they're here to challenge. Butcher uh, collected an extra wave in the bottom and now I imagine he will venture up to join his teammates in glorious battle. 20 seconds or so left before Datasto can claim this full jailbreak here on Alterac Pass. And here we go. Raynor is not here. He needs to come down uh, and join this. And he is. There he goes. Uh, Karthin able to channel on the backside. Cancel the objective for Datasto. Datasto kind of just backed up. Um, a nice controlled retreat. Cleared out the mercenaries in the mid lane. Uh, keeping their fort alive. There's the Dragon Arrow Apocalypse catches. Nobody. The Apocalypse just a hair late. 
Uh, but it will not matter, or will it? Oh my goodness, poor Butcher is like in a pinball video game. I thought Johanna was going down as well, uh, but she was able to falling sword to safety. If uh, Diablo would just hit that APOC button like a half a second sooner, these, these wombo combos would be so beautifully on point. Um, but, but still effective nonetheless, it would just be that much more so. A Paraloot taking control one more time, channeling the objective. Uh, with 40 seconds to go though, that Tasta will have time to spawn, tap, and contest this should they choose to. They would just be choosing to contest probably down 16 to 15. Uh, also in the bottom lane, I didn't notice, but the waves were starting to do a lot of damage to this keep, forcing that Tasto to respond. By clearing out that bottom wave, they may have, um, not may have, they did, concede the objective Oh, they're trying to get in here just the last minute. Two seconds. Oh, they did cancel. Rechannel, rechannel, rechannel. That Tasto arriving just in the nick of time. I stand corrected. They were able to save their bottom keep and drive them off of the objective. And the, the health bars were pretty low on Paralute, so that was a really good call of them not to contest that. They probably would have been in a world of hurt. And if you're a Kurt Dog, he has to be tasting that completed objective. 184, he is so close. And look in the mid lane, this big juicy stack of meat that's here waiting for him. And that's where he's going. Or is he? I figured he would go get that while his teammates defended. Um, but he's not. He's kind of hanging around. Oh my goodness. Karazim just put so much damage. And there is the Furnace Blast all the way past. Gets all the way to Ariel. But Diablo on the backside goes down as that deep, deep Butcher Charge kind of zoned everybody from Paraloot away. Riptire only catches one as Crypt Digger uh, using that uh, Ice Block to save him. But look at the Scatter Arrow is just chunking out uh, the members of that task, though, so much so that they can't stay in this. I, I think Paraloot is going to win this 3v5 uh, with the damage and the poke. If that Tasto decides to stay in, but Butcher is coming back. Rainer, oh my goodness, eating a full scatter arrow there. They are so low, but Butcher is not low. He has a glowing red cleaver just waiting for anybody to step too close. Now I think if you're that Tasto, are they going to come in? They have to, and they're going to lose bottom keep if they don't do something here soon. They, they need to do something. Um, a lot of indecision by that Tasto kind of taking a lot of free poke here. Rainer did go back. Now all members are up five on five. Scatter Arrow from Hanzo is doing so much damage. And there is the Furnace Blast in the Concussion onto the Hanzo with the Falling Sword. That is why they wanted the Falling Sword. And into a full Blizzard, Diablo and Varian are in trouble. A three for naught. Somebody clip that, please. That needs to go to the Nexus Edge. Great play by Datas, though. I think they're going to lose this bottom keep if somebody doesn't go down there fast, though. That task, though, does not seem to care. So, next objective. We've only had two. 17 minutes into the game, and we've only had two objectives. Second one will be secured, and uh, unfortunately, keep going down for free. Paraloot getting the first... First keep of the game. Um, with some Winions and Catas in the bottom lane, those, ca those occasional Catapults just kind of wore down that keep there. So a 3-2 split coming out for Death Tasto, prioritizing top and mid. There goes the Rip Tire. That will zone away Butcher and Kerosene. And uh, just kind of doing everything they can to burn down the objective. Look at there's a flanking Johanna. Nice whip. There is the Furnace Blast, there is the Fung Sword, but a Vault over the wall. Hanzo gets out safely, and now members of that Tasto are tanking, at least until Welly made it in there, but Butcher is the first to go down. Nice play by Hanzo to, uh, I think it's Natural Agility, over the wall and kind of bait Butcher into a really terrible position. Bottom objective is pretty healthy here, and then this fort should go down uh, in, in quick order for that task, though, and it does. 
So that keep looming large. 15 to 14 in kills. Very close in level. Uh, structures are even numerically. Both teams have three forts slash keeps left. However, that Tasto does not have their bottom lane keep. And that is where Paraloot is putting their focus on this boss. And uh, I don't think that Tasto realizes, or if they do, with Butcher just spawning, they're choosing not to do anything about it. I will say, again, the bosses on Alterac Pass are not particularly strong. And the unique mechanic on Alterac Pass is unless this boss actually kills Core, it is totally useless because the Core will simply respawn itself. On the flip side, that pass, they're going to get the other side boss, and I think with Butcher and Raynor, they're going to secure it before Paraloot can arrive. So what's the choice if you're that Tasto? Are they going to push with it? Are they going to ignore bottom boss? I think that's the call. The bottom boss is not going to do anything by itself. The core and the Katas should kill that. But they're escorting this in. While they have push in the mid as well. So core starting to take some damage for that task though. I'm going to try to flash over there in just a minute. The boss is already half dead and the core is just fine. There goes Hyperion as does Riptire. Zoning to catching Jaina and Raynor. Chunking them out both pretty hard. Uh, trying to get a counter key pill here. There's the Apoch. However, Butcher used Unstoppable. Dragon Arrow misses. Furnace Blast did not. That Tasto on the Warpath again, pushing hard. Crystal Age is forced to be popped to try to keep Diablo up, but it is not enough. Riding this boss all the way to the core through the keep. There goes Butcher onto Hanzo. He is going to go down. Kurt Dog going crazy on the back line. Paraloot is in trouble. Is this going to be game number two? Unless Junkrat can pull out a miracle here. There goes Riptire. He's going to get somebody here. Storm Shield. Great use of the Storm Shield there. Now, if you are that Tasto, you have to finish the core. Junkrat, I'm sorry, Johanna and Butcher both go down. And the Junkrat solo defense. Karazim going in. Can Rainer finish him? The boss takes out Karazim, or the core, I should say. The two handed hammer on his head. Riptire is available again. Jaina is dead if she doesn't have Ice Block. And she doesn't. Junkrat with the core defense. And now it will start to heal. What a crazy game two we are having. In the meantime, both objectives are up. All of these uh, jail guards, these prison guards are bored. They're sitting here. And let's see what Paraloot does. They're going to have about 15 seconds here of full team advantage. Going to go ahead, grab the Merc Camp mid. I would have kind of liked to see them go straight to the objective. Although, having said that, the objective is 50 seconds. So they're not going to get it in its entirety regardless. So not an entirely bad decision to get some uh, macro pressure. Now, the positioning of this particular objective is going to favor that task, though because they, the lane they need to defend is much closer. The lane Paraloot needs to defend is all the way on the other side of the map. Sometime in the near future, somebody is going to have to go deal with that. Um, so the, the macro pressure right now in favor of that task, though. But they need to get in here. 30 seconds left on this objective. That task, though, in no rush. Now, here they come. Stepping in, there's the Johanna with the four-man blind. Kurt Dog waiting for his moment on the flank. There's the Furnace Blast. They are going to go in. They do go on to Hanzo. He is locked down. Crystal Aegis keeps him up for now. Taunting on Butcher to keep him, keep him going. The Divine Palm does not proc, but that's two more, three more, four more members. I don't think Junkrat can defend Core this time. Which way are they going to go? They haven't channeled. I don't think they realized that they didn't finish the channel. There we go. This objective will go, no doubt. Over to Dat Tass, though, and they are going to get another crack. Uh, at the core here with this objective, 
a huge wave. Look at this wave here in the bottom lane, pushing this in. Butcher now up to 320 stacks. They've executed this kind of Butcher Johanna falling sword thing really well. Riptire is going to obliterate this wave, and it does. It, like, one-shots it. Uh, Karazim going in and just wailing on, on Junkrat, forcing him back to the Hall of Storms. Johanna is protecting the Jailbreak. Bottom keep goes down in eight seconds. Oh, dude. Overextended. The Scatter Arrow not able to finish the job as Karazim and Junkrat both very low after that exchange. But let's see what that task, though, does with this objective. Are they going to try to triple keep? Is that the plan here? Or are they going to try to rotate all the way to the top and push in? It looks like they're making the triple keep play. With all members up and available to defend, I don't think that's a bad call. You don't want to force something under core if you don't need to. Also on Alterac, the more keeps you destroy, the weaker the core is, of course. So actually, that task, though, is coming in with this bottom wave, ignoring the mid wave. They're riding this in. No response yet from Perlu. They're going straight to core. Here we go. Now both teams are converging on the core. There goes Hyperion. There goes Dragonair Apoc, which actually catches nobody except for Jaina was forced to ice block. Diablo caught in a huge mess, and he is the first to fall, but the core is going down fast. Game 2 and the 2-0 domination over to Dat Tasto. Coming up off the map big time in game number 1 and flashing the uh flashing the butcher in game 2. Uh 8 deaths is is a lot of deaths of course, but they they used the setup with the uh the uh, Hellgate, or the, is that what it's called? Furnace Blast. Thank you. I don't know why I was thinking Hellgate. The Furnace Blast and the Falling Sword really put a lot of pressure on to Paraloot. And uh, Jaina really had a lot of space to operate. And Crypt Digger did a great job of using that Ice Block at just the right time. Let's see if we can get maybe a Kurt Dog to come on in for an interview. And then we'll find some other NGS action to throw you fine people over. Let's look at Rainer. What did he take? I just have such a hard time uh, not taking that f the uh, ace in the hole with with that comp for uh, for that task. Though I mean, Austin Powers got plenty of damage. All right, we are. We're going to have somebody from that task, though, coming over. It looks like it'll be Trevaro on the Karazim. Hey, right. Trevaro. How's it going, man? What's up? Congrats, guys. Big 2-0 there. Uh, Thanks, man. Let's start with game one. You guys, boy, you kind of look dead to rights. There were, uh, <laughs> a, there were a lot of blue structures left on the battlefield, and, and there were not a lot of red structures uh, left yeah. on the battlefield. Um, tell me, what, what kind of conversations are you guys having You know, after you lose that, that second keep? What, what were you guys identifying with each other as what needed to be done to take that game back? I mean, on BOE, it's not a game until both keeps are down anyway. So we're ready to play at that point. <laughs> the i don't know so 
we know we can team fight and we know on that map especially that team fighting is very very essential to winning that map so all we were doing is trying to make it to the late game without losing the game and we knew that if we can make it to the end of the game then at level 20 we can team fight with the best of them so we're gonna try and give it all we got so we won a couple good team fights there got a big immortal and then they just unfortunately we're for them we're staggering deaths so yeah, that that's really what I highlighted. Kind of it, yeah, I, ha- I highlighted that at the end too. A couple big sta- big staggers really kind of opened the door for you guys. Yeah. Um. So two so two moments in that game I want to talk about before we go to game two. So yeah. you've just lost your second keep, but you killed the immortal. You're moving out as a team, uh, trying to make a play. You guys all bush toward the top lane, and you let Diablo walk by and then kill Rainer. How hard was it not to just kill Diablo? Because you had to be thinking about it. Uh, honestly, this is the kind of stuff that I'm talking about when I say we can team fight with the best of them because we practice this kind of stuff where you let the tank go by and you wait because Diablo didn't check that bush. He did not. And so because Diablo didn't check that bush, we had free reign to attack on Raynor. And so we were just waiting, being patient. The call was on Raynor. Well, the call was to wait on whoever comes after Diablo, and it happened to be Raynor, and then we just blew him up. And Kurt Dog had that massive play. I think he counter-striked from out of vision onto the Ariel uh, and, and yeah. caught her on the Immortal stun as well. Um, and yes. I, I think that was really the kill that kind of sealed it for you guys. When you guys go and rewatch that cast, uh, once Raynor died, I was like, Paraloot, give it. Like, just... You're, for the next 50 seconds, you're down. You have like all your structures up. Just give it up. Like live to fight another day. But man, those big time staggers and a, uh, a huge comeback there. But let's go into game two. How much do you guys work on that falling sword furnace blast butcher thing that you had going on there? Because I didn't quite see what you were doing until you did it. And then it, and then it clicked because I've never seen that particular combination ran. So we've got the mad science strats in our discord where we come up with the craziest ideas for combinations that we can come up with. And this one came about a couple weeks ago, really not too long ago. And we, this is the first time we've executed it in like a real competitive play. So it was fun. It's a fun combo. It was fun to get going. We tried to do it last week on a different map and it didn't work. So. Yeah, it was a little hit or miss this game, but when it hit, it hit pretty big. Yeah, it's it, it's got some fine tuning to do. Don't get me wrong. We can twerk it a little bit, but we should be able to make it work. A little. Okay, last, last question. Austin Powers, why no ace in the hole at one with the comp, the Jaina, the slows on the falling sword and the punish? I, I was flabbergasted when I see it. You saw I didn't take ace in the hole at one on Ray. <laughs> My man lives and dies by veteran marksman, and he swears by it. And honestly, he can carry games and do well, and he didn't die that game. So Yeah, I mean, I, I was I looking mean, at the numbers after the game, and my comment was, I mean, well, clearly it works for him. I'm not going to bust him too much, but I'm, I was, I'm just looking at all the slows, and I'm like, oh, my God, Ace in the hole. But he made it work. His damage numbers were good, didn't die. Um, I mean, in that particular we've, comp... We've talked about it. We've definitely brought it up before, but he, he swears by it, and I stand by it. Fair enough, fair enough. And, you know, in that particular comp, I will say, though, um, Rainer is almost unnoticed, I want to say. I mean, the Johanna Butcher, even Karazim, all up in your face like that, it kind of just allows him to be around and right-click on people. I bet you he was uh, pretty comfortable most of that game. <laughs> Yeah, I think he was enjoying the right-click sesh he was having. Well, congrats on the 2-0, guys. That's really going to put you in a good spot for uh, for securing the, some playoff spot down there. We're going to pull you up probably toward the middle of the standings, my guess would be. Any uh, shout-outs on your way out the door? Uh, Yeah, shout-outs to you for casting this. Shout-out to Twitch chat. Shout-out to the team. Everybody played well. It was a good game and yeah thanks for doing this for us anytime guys good luck going forward congratulations again on the 2-0 and uh thank you have a good evening you too man
I was going to send you guys over to, well, let's see. There's only one possible game that's going on right now. Let's see if it's, oh, it is. Perfect. All right, so starting here in about five minutes is Murda, who will be casting another Division C game, Calculated Throw versus Ban Cho. So I will send him, send you guys his way. Um, and uh, speaking of Murda, him and I will actually be casting the Thursday night showdown this week, 6 p.m. Pacific. Pre-game coverage starting at about 5.30 or so, twitch.tv slash Nexus Gaming Series. That's where you can find me next. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great night, guys, and uh, we'll catch you Thursday.